Okay, I, I'm going to kick off uh, the event, folks. Um, uh, I know that people will continue to be joining us. Uh, today is March 29th, uh, 2021, and welcome to another uh, NIPEI event. Uh, we hold these events uh, pretty much uh, on a monthly basis, uh, especially once the pandemic started. Uh, and we've had different topics along the way. Uh, many of them are recommended events from our members. Um, I'm Ron Mazursky. Uh, I'm the founder of NIPEI and a board member uh, and a managing director at Pagility Advisors. That's my full-time gig. Um, today's event uh, is entitled Loyalty 2021, where are loyalty and rewards and financial services heading? Uh, once we're ready to uh, uh, roll this thing uh, ahead, um, I'm going to uh, uh, hand it off to uh, Thad. But as a preface to the session, I just want to thank you, uh, give a thank you to our sponsor uh, for this event, DWT. Um, attendees, uh, can I ask you to please mute yourselves and shut off your cameras so we have a better uh, experience? Um, also, uh, please note that all questions uh, that you have can be posted in chat, and I'll go through them and ask them uh, of the moderator uh, once we, uh, we get to that point in the program. Uh, and also, please feel free to use the chat feature on the bottom uh, to share your contact information or LinkedIn information for folks that you want, and you can end up saving that chat um, to look at later. Um, I'm going to ask uh, um, all attendees that want to to stay on afterwards for a breakout networking session, um, and we've done this in the past. It's been pretty well received. Um, there'll be somewhere around eight or ten people in each networking session. Uh, you'll all be put into random groups um, for that networking and then feel free uh, if you want to move into other breakout sessions to meet other people. Um, uh, many of our um, uh, panelists today and the moderator um, will be joining us in those bank breakout sessions in case you want to get to know them uh, a little bit better. Um, uh, I'd like to let you know that uh, we have some upcoming events planned already. Uh, on April 13th, that event is Naked Interchange exposing the problem of value transfer. What do you think that topic is about? And then we're gonna be followed by another event the following week on April 20th called, yes, once again, Naked Interchange, exposing the, uh, sorry, Naked Interchange, redressing the concept of value transfer. I wanna kick off the session in just one minute and ask you one more thing, that if there are topics you'd like us to, to consider using in the future, could you um, uh, put that into the chat area as well? Like Ron, consider X, Ron, consider Y. Um, or feel free to send me an email at ronald.mazursky, that's M-A-Z-U-R-S-K-Y at nipay.org. Let me uh, now head off to uh, hand the session to uh, our moderator for today's session. His name is Thad Peterson. That is a senior analyst at ITA Group. Um, Thad, it's all yours. Thank you. Thanks, Ron, and thanks everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Uh, like Ron said, I'm with IT Group, as, as if you couldn't tell that from the sign behind me. But we're here to talk about loyalty and rewards and financial services, and we have about the best panel one could have to discuss that topic. And it's also a great time to have this conversation. Since the earliest days of commerce, merchants have had three simple goals that are still at the center of any customer engagement strategy profitably increase average spend per transaction, profitably increase frequency of usage and visits, or increase per customer revenue over a given period of time. The only way for a merchant to achieve those objectives when the customer has a choice of providers is to be sure that the customer is buying through them more often than other providers and spending more on each visit. So the customer needs to have a reason to prefer that provider over the competitor. In some cases, location, superior products and services, and lower prices can drive repeat visits. But it's a fairly safe assumption that if a consumer has a choice of providers and they're exercising that choice, the value propositions between the providers aren't different enough to keep a customer locked into a single merchant. This basic truth of commerce created the space for a new method of customer retention, loyalty and rewards programs. In the payments world, the differences between payment types particularly if we're talking about cards, are relatively small. All of the open loop cards run on one of the four networks and all of the networks are pretty much accepted anywhere that the customer wants to shop. The goal for a card issuer is to be top of wallet, 
to be the preferred card used by the cardholder for most, if not all, their transactions. Differentiation can be, can be created through lower APRs, higher credit limits, or even prettier cards. But at the end of the day, there's not a lot of incentive to use one card over another unless there's a tangible reward to do so. And generally, that's a loyalty program. Loyalty programs have been part of the card payment ecosystem for a long time. And the category has matured to a point where the foundations of card loyalty programs are fairly well understood by consumers. And optimizing return on card usage has become both a differentiator for card issuers and a significant topic of discussion among heavy users, particularly in the travel space. But the world of commerce and payments is rapidly changing and that's having a major impact on the evolution of loyalty. And now we have the pandemic. Customer behavior has changed as we all were forced to shop and buy in new and different ways. How will the loyalty space adapt to this rapidly changing, extremely complex and often downright confusing environment? That's what we're here to talk about today. And with that, uh, let's introduce our panel and we'll start with Nabil. Thank you, Sam. Pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Nabil Kabani. I am CEO of Cielo Pay, which is a mobile payment loyalty and reward platform with a ecosystem of reward partners. I spend most of my career in financial services, um, FinTech more precisely, Western Union payment processing and others. And we quickly realized in financial services, many services being prioritized or similar enough that we needed something additional to retain customers and increase their spend with us. And, and there come, came loyalty platforms. And obviously our newest venture is exclusively focused on that. So I'm looking forward to our panel and honored to be among this illustrious group of panelists. Thanks, Nabil. Simon? Thank you, Thad. And uh, hello, everyone. Simon Lutzi. I'm the Managing Director and GM of Chase Travel. Um, I've been in the travel industry for over 25 years in a variety of capacity, and I am really passionate about making the customer experience better. So I, just, I kind of really subscribe to the Stanford principles of design thinking for anything and everything we do. Um, and uh, I'm equally um, uh, excited to discuss this topic with, uh, with my fellow panelists and uh, hearing hopefully some great questions. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Simon. Brian? Hey everyone, I'm Brian Kelly. I'm founder and CEO of thepointsguy.com, which is a website focused on helping consumers get the most value from their credit card points, airline miles, hotel points, and uh, we've grown the site. Now I'm, there's uh, about 100 points guys and girls who work for the company. We've got an office in the UK. And, uh, you know, even with the pandemic, there's been so much change over the last year uh, with rewards programs, many for the positive, including new redemptions and making it less friction, frictionless to use all of these rewards, which have been building up. And uh, I am an eternal optimist and think that, uh, the, our best days are ahead of us in terms of loyalty and points. And, you know, frankly, nowadays for consumers, they've got more options than ever. Uh, but a lot of times they just don't know that. So I, I've got to focus on the consumer angle and, and helping consumers get the most value and feel comfortable traveling again. So happy to be here and look forward to it. Hey, thanks, Brian. So let's let's start the conversation. The, the COVID pan pandemic has been had an impact on just about every aspect of our personal and professional lives, but how has it directly impacted the loyalty space and financial services? Yeah. You, go you so. want to go, Brian? No, all you. <laughs> all right. So, you know, obviously, you know, for us, so I manage the Ultimate Rewards Travel Portal. And, uh, you know, for us, it was obviously a complete pivot from a growing business down to dealing with cancellations and refunds and, and non-refundables and the pain that comes with all of that. Uh, I predicted a year ago that uh, the, the end of non-refundable fares would be near. Um, we're not quite there yet, although I still feel like that's probably something that um, should happen over time. So for us as a business, obviously, as I mentioned, you know, the customer focus was uh, was there almost immediately. So we really worked day and night in figuring out ways of uh, making it simple for cancellations to be processed, for, uh, you know, rebookings to be done, um, for, you know, getting people points back where, where applicable. Um, you know, and the challenge obviously is as an, as an issuer of, uh, of airline tickets specifically with points that you're on the hook for, 
uh, and and folks don't necessarily realize that we're buy, uh, you know buying by the uh, the rules of the airline. So um, it was I would say a very challenging time, uh, but coming out with some creative solutions, I think we've, we've weathered the, the the storm. We of course had to then really think through you know having some uh, great travel cards with great point to cash value. Like how else can and would uh, folks want to use their points? So. We've really pivoted and, and invested heavily in, uh, you know, in dining, uh, in our partnership with uh, with DoorDash uh, as well. And then our latest feature really is to, was around pay yourself back um, to allow folks to get cash back on, on the purchases they, they needed the most. For us, it was really a focus on, hey, what do people need during the pandemic? Uh, you know, people losing their, their jobs and being flexible. And so um, that's been that's been great to stand something up. Uh, that we didn't have before just uh you know and now hopefully like brian said it seems like uh, consumer confidence is rising and and uh we're hopefully having this behind us and we're on the road again yeah yeah simon i'll just give you kudos as a an avid chase user myself i actually was supposed to go to puerto rico tomorrow and had to cancel last minute and i had booked hotel through ultimate rewards and technically it was past the deadline but chase you know, figured it out and um, and I got the full refund for it. So I think there've been a lot of, it's good that airlines and hotels have gone above and beyond, you know, with getting rid of fees. A year ago or pre-pandemic, it was all about what new fee is a consumer gonna get hit with? So it's been a nice, it's been a nice year having fees dropped off, especially within loyalty points. And I, I don't know if everyone on this call realizes, but you know, you can book and change your airline ticket with no fee, but you're not gonna get your money back. Um, and when you use points in most every airline, hotel, and a lot of the credit card programs, you can actually uh, redeem for award travel and then get all of your miles and points and taxes and fees back. So there's a, a, a much higher level of flexibility for consumers nowadays, but there, you know, there have been a lot of positive changes, but there have been so many changes. I think pretty much every single travel credit card has had new perks. Uh, you know, whether Amex Platinum adding PayPal benefits and credits or, you know, on the Chase Sapphire cards, being able to redeem points for groceries and dining at the same rate you could redeem for air and hotel. Um, so for the consumer, it's been a good, but almost impossible to track all the train changes across the board. And are these permanent changes or are they temporary? But um, I do think, you know, consumers can now use their points for a whole lot more than they could at, at a better value. Um, I do think the industry needs to adapt more. Travel is coming back. You know, the TSA numbers are over 60% of what they were pre-pandemic, which is pretty incredible considering a year ago, April, we got down to like 80,000 daily visitor or daily uh, passengers. We're now up over 1 point, about 1.6 million has been in the average this past weekend. So uh, still down from two and a half or so, but definitely coming back, but there's still, it's going to take a long time to get a lot of people comfortable. There's still a lot of questions on vaccines, business travel, I think is a huge question mark right now. How does the industry evolve in a, in a you know, climate where there's not huge amounts of business travel, but um, I think uh, in, in general for the consumer side that there's, a, it's, there's never been a better time to be in points and loyalty. Uh, and go ahead. We've seen a, uh, well, everybody lost, status, right? With travel and, and uh, hotels and so on. Nobody moved and lost their status. Some companies have dealt better with than others and extended people statuses. You know, for us as a provider of solution, we noticed for the first six months, everybody froze like a deer in a headlight. Uh, this was the top priority, biggest priority for companies was how do we restart activity? Um, although in our mind, we thought the most important thing you want to do right now is retain your customers. But but there was a more fundamental base of repair reaction saying, I need to survive and we'll worry about the other pieces later. Um, but there was also a big jump into cashback diapers and anything that has to do with online shopping. I mean, Amazon Prime um, and a lot of the paid reward programs picked up a lot of customers during this period because of the function of what they've offered. So it, it shifted a little bit from being to attract customers based on the rewards and a lot more towards was your functionality necessary during the pandemic or something they will get back to at the end of the pandemic, which I think we're starting to see now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's 
it's interesting that behavior, you, you guys changed the programs up. What of, what of the uh, changes that have been made are gonna stick after the pandemic? So for instance, Simon, the DoorDash thing, do you think those things are gonna be a part of your regular program going forward or, or what's gonna happen? Are we gonna revert back to the old days? I think, you know, we gotta look at it as a flexibility and you, you, the times where you design a product and you hope that it's in the marketplace for five years, I think are over, uh, you know, like a lot of people talk about agility. And, and so you just have to kind of look at what's happening, you know, with customers and, and what, what is the demand out there, right? So we obviously feel very, very good about the partnership that we have with, with DoorDash uh, and with other partners, uh, you know, such as Lyft as well. So, so for the time being, it's been incredibly successful. You know, we have uh, a lot of people that are using it from, you know, being stuck at home and, you know, like me, I, I think I'm gaining weight from uh, having all these DoorDash uh, offers being dropped off. Um, but, you know, the question is really then what is sort of as this pandemic is behind us, what what uh, trends are going to be emerging? Are people really ready to be out in restaurants again? So is it going to get harder uh, to get into a, a really great restaurant in your city or even as you're you know traveling somewhere mm -hmm. as well? You know, I remember a couple of years ago, we were all trying to figure out kind of like, what is what is going to be the the restaurant? How are you going to get into 11 Madison or, you know, into the French Laundry? And it was three, four, five, six months wait lists and stuff. So, you know, the question is, is that going to come back again? Does And will loyalty be the the, the provider that will, will be able to get you kind of last minute into uh, experiences, uh, whether that's dining or other places? So I think... My, my point to that would just be, you know, you got to just have the pulse and the ear to the, to, to what's happening in, with, in the consumer space and adapt. So with, with the pandemic, uh, people were putting a lot of money in the bank and savings accounts and savings, savings rates have gone up way high. Does the same thing happen in points? Or has, has point accumulation kind of continued to go up as people have been unable to burn them? Yeah, for sure, to some degree, yes. Um, but we've also seen uh, quite a bit of activity then in whether that's, you know, redeeming points for cash or points transfer in other areas. Uh, I think it's all about just having flexibility in the way that you look at your points bank and, and allowing folks to, uh, you know, to use them uh, in other ways. So interestingly enough, I mean, we've seen some, some portfolios where there has been an increase in, in what I would say, like point saving. Mm -hmm. um, but now that we are uh, sort of, I would say we're still in the middle of a pandemic, but it feels like, to Brian's point, like, you know, 60% TSA, people are ready to get out. Uh, that I think travel is going to come back with a vengeance, and we, we will see also a lot of redemptions. Uh, we're seeing it now, and, and I would expect that to, to continue. So talking about cash, there's been a mag migration to cash back incentives, obviously, um, in in credit cards, particularly against travel or merchandise, um, why why is this happening, and what does it mean for the for the overall loyalty space? Anybody? Else? Yeah, so I'm happy to take this. Um, so okay. we've had two type of programs: uh, card linked offers and um, direct cashback offers that are connected to the merchant. And card linked offers typically tend to be promotional and transient in nature. And you could have one type of vendor, one type of industry for a given period of time and then another one. Uh, and that would ch change. And we found customers had a hard time tracking which type of stores were promoting and, and the, the, their need wasn't necessarily matched with what the, uh, those card link offers were offering. Although some of them had great programs. So we've switched to a uh, permanent cashback program, which is working on um, gift card raising that is permanent and attached to the actual vendor. And that's been working quite well. I think there's been a, uh, a surge in people figuring out, you know, the value that they get back and trying to be more economical. I think people who are hit by pandemic became more cash savvy as well. So we've seen actually increasing demand for programs like that in our case. Interesting. Um, and I can say just from my angle, uh, you know, at the points guy, you know, our core audience likes to redeem for first class international awards. That's where you get the most bang for your buck. But considering, you know, throughout most of the last year, the, the world's been closed up and, and then domestic airfares have been ridiculously cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen $30 fares cross country. It doesn't really make sense to redeem when you can just easily buy uh, tickets cheaply. Um, so I know myself just in that Puerto Rico redemption, I was going to say at the Vanderbilt hotel, which is the nicest hotel in Condado. I use my chase UR points to just book that directly. And 
that's much different. In, in general, I would save my chase points to redeem on, you know, transfer to United and redeem on Lufthansa first class to go to South Africa. But um, I think I think as travel has become cheaper, um, people have wanted to get more tangible, easy to understand uh, benefits that help their personal bottom line, especially as there's been a lot of unease about the economy and people trying to shore up as much cash as possible. But I do expect uh, consumers to get back into the uh, the long haul international rewards, the, at least the, the high end premium travel customers. But it's going to be a while before that happens because Asia and a, a lot of the world is still going to be locked up for a while now. Mm -hmm. What about merchandise? I mean, merchandise used to be a big deal in, in, in uh, credit card loyalty, and you don't hear about it nearly as much anymore. Is, is this still a thing or is it pretty much gone to uh, travel and cash? Sorry. What do you say merchandising? Are you are you saying kind of, you know, shop shop for products other than yeah, buying, uh, just product. buying product? Uh, it's still it's still actually, you know, pretty successful. As I say, as I said, there there are uh, ways to to do that. And, and you just have to be, um, you know, looking at, uh, you know, where, where are consumers buying anyway and where there's where there is, uh, you know, ways to do so. So I mean, we have had several uh, Apple products, a great partnership with those guys, uh, and, and shop points for Apple products and promotions, which have been, you know, very, very successful. So I think you just have to be kind of, uh, at the, at the pulse of it. Um, you know, one, one interesting thing, um, is also we, we've kind of pivoted a little bit and allowed also for cash back on, uh, on home improvement stores. Uh, so a lot of us been stuck at home and, you know, look at the same kitchen and you go, oh man, I, I need to do something with that. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, you talk to a lot of contractors, pe people are busy, people are, you know, looking at renovating their homes. And so, I mean, that was another way for us to just provide value and, and, and let redemptions happening in, in, in other spaces. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'll let this probably run for a bit and we'll see where consumer demand, uh, you know, shifts. I can say the value prop from a consumer angle, you know, uh, merchandise, I always cringed when people would tell me, oh, I use my million Amex points for Weber grill. And I'm like, no, you could have gone to Paris 10 times. Uh, but, and the valuations for, were not as good historically, but I know, and especially in the case of Chase and using your points at the same, you know, 1.5 cents a piece on a Sapphire, Sapphire Reserve for dining or groceries. So I, I do applaud the companies that have increased the value for consumers knowing instead of taking advantage of consumers knowing, well, they can't redeem on travel right now. So let's gouge them and just eviscerate the value of their points at a really low ratio. Um, the industry has stepped up. I, do I think they could step up a little bit more and allow more categories to kind of at, at those top levels? But um, of course, I'm going to always advocate for as much value back on the redemption side. Um, but, uh, I, you know, one of the other areas I think will be interesting this year is the launch of uh, the Bitcoin and crypto earning credit cards that I think present an interesting value proposition to consumers. You know, it can be argued that airline miles over the last decade or so have become less valuable as the airlines sell so many to the credit card companies. And, you know, so technically those could be declining value currencies. You know, you can't redeem for 25,000 mile flight like you could 10 years ago. You know, now it's 60,000 to go a lot of places domestically. I can see a consumer appeal in getting cryptocurrency automatically. And that currency, as we've seen, of course, not it doesn't always go up. It's highly volatile, but you know, consumers are used to seeing the messages that crypto is just going to keep going up, 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 up. So I do know there is a demand in the marketplace. We'll see how much when those cards launch later this year, but it could be a unique consumer value prop. Hey, get this currency that could be worth 200% more in value in a year. Versus the airline miles, which, you know, they control the currency and change them at their own whim. So it's yeah. definitely something to look out for. It's going to be really interesting to see if that's just a shiny new thing or it actually sticks. Uh, it probably has everything to do with what crypto does between now and the launch of those cards. Uh, yep. If it's still going up, it'll probably be fine. But uh, I, it's going to be interesting to see that. And, and it raises an interesting question, which is demographic differences between somebody who's picking a crypto reward versus an air miles reward versus a cash reward. Are there demographic differences in those three different categories, for instance? I think there's a lot of overlap actually. And there's a lot of people have made a lot of money. I know BlockFi is targeting, you know, the new, the whole new wave of crypto millionaires out there and providing them financial solutions on this huge currency that they've got sitting there and, you know, giving uh, loans and mortgages based on that crypto value that, 
something that most major banks can't process today. You can't even on most banks buy crypto through your asset managers. So uh, I do think that there's a, you know, millennials and Gen Z are very much into crypto, same audience that reads the point sky and wants to get more value out of life. So I definitely do think that there's a big overlap. Do I think crypto credit cards will be the killer of travel rewards cards? No, especially because beyond the points on travel rewards cards, it's all about perks. And uh, now more than ever, people have been afraid to travel. They want to travel, cut lines, minimize contact, sit up front. So I do think, but the travel rewards programs aren't going to be knocked out by crypto, but they shouldn't rest on their laurels and think, oh, well, people will always want travel because, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Brian. And, and this, these are more my personal views than Chase views, it's just for disclosure. Um, but it is, crypto is an interesting uh, you know, piece, and, and I, I sort of wonder is 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 a disruption in terms of like membership points or or miles ready, right? I mean, like these things have been around since the early '90s, and uh, you know we're sort of still in this, you know, who is the five x, ten x game, and who wins that, or, or you know who's given you more value for your points, but you know uh, actually creating uh, you know another currency, perhaps whether it's crypto or something else, is, is that really the game that you know, could win loyalty again. So it's a bit provoking and I'm probably going to give some, some startups a, an idea of something here that I will regret. That's why I'm saying it's my personal opinion, but it's an interesting, you know, topic, something that I at least personally, uh, you know, I'm following quite closely. So we'll see. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think that this, this trend aligns with everything we're seeing, which is the consumers are becoming more sophisticated and they want more control over how their rewards are being used. So crypto, you know, with the addition of being an appreciating currency until it's not, um, is similar to cash. It's very fungible and gives you control and choices around how you can use your rewards. And I've, you know, I know conversations we've had where we plan vacation or plan to use our points, but a lot of friends as well. And what we're seeing in the market is people become, thanks to the points guy, and, and I've been a follower of the points guy since, since the early days, we've become sophisticated enough to understand what is the exchange value using different types of, of services. So you may get a better deal flying Delta than you may get flying uh, United, or you may get a better deal buying Weber Grill or not. And of course, you know, Brian will jump on me and say, no, that's not the good deal. But people have learned this. And they've also learned that they can get a, a fungible method that allows them to choose between whether they want travel or merchandising or other things. And so, you know, cash is, is primordially is that ability to control and, and um, choose the type of rewards you want. But I think what companies have done well, for example, I mean, we're uh, Chase customers and big Chase fans. We, you know, when you get good value over a trip uh, or the price of a ticket with your points, that's where you're going to go. It doesn't pay into cash or into something else. I think you're going to constantly see this competition between people arbitraging. Do I get cash out so I can go buy things in cash or do I use the existing um, reward marketplaces and tickets and offers and find where I'm going to get the most bang for my buck. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting statement, uh, you know, because you think about how things have changed, uh, you know, there's some providers out there that will try to, you know, not necessarily high, but make it more difficult for you to figure out what your points value versus dollar value. And you really have to then think about in the checkout process or somewhere else, like, you know, is to, you know, is that Weber grill now going to cost me really 700 bucks versus the $300 I could get somewhere else. Um, but, you know, we found by being super transparent about what the points are worth and, and, and providing value to that, that actually has been super successful for us. Right. We're, we're, we're making it, um, you know, public on, on the chase uh, reserve card that, yeah, you currently can redeem for 150 pips and, uh, and people take advantage of it. And I think that's, uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Now, talking about customer control of the situation and, and customers managing their own experience, pay with points is now becoming a common feature at sites like Amazon and all over the web, frankly. And, and it's also starting to show up at physical POS. How is that going to impact customer behavior and, and will it benefit the FIs that offer a pay with points capability? Simon, you want to take that? Yeah, I, you know, look, I think this is something that um, inevitably, again, it goes into consumer demand. Consumer want to have flexibility in that. They want to pay with their points at the checkout. Uh, I think it is something that, uh, you know, we have to continue to monitor and see. I mean, there's, uh, you know, folks out there that are doing a very good job, whether that's, uh, you know, even with, uh, with Amazon or with PayPal or, 
uh, or others. Uh, so I think it, it all comes back down to, again, to like consumer demand and then making it super simple and making it so that in the checkout, you can still, uh, you know, so like we obviously want to make sure that people select the Chase cards as they go through another uh, payment mechanism um, or pay with the points uh, in that in that sense. So so I think we will probably see growth um, in in the way people look at, at pay with points. So I think it's here to stay for the for the next the next little while for sure. Yeah, and I think yeah, just I mean, cash back has been around forever, and uh, I think people still want flexibility, though. You know, the ability to use points, even if they don't want to fly first class uh, on a flight, but they do want to have that ability to use first class. So I know a lot of consumers, you know, I, I haven't seen, and I, you know, we focus on the upmarket travel space. We haven't seen a huge shift to cash back because you would think if people just want the cash back, they would get a simple cash back card. It's easy to understand, but people still do want to go into a portal. They want to see all the different options and unique uh, redemptions and partnerships that give not just points, but also perks and uh, elite status. So uh, I think it is important. Consumers now more than ever are valuing the perk side and the service. And did this credit card stand by me when my whole honeymoon got upended with the pandemic? And I do think there's been a, you know, some companies better than others, you know, have built huge brand loyalty throughout the pandemic that people will stick with them, it's especially Delta in terms of airlines. They have really gone, in my opinion, way above and beyond in, uh, consumer flexibility, blocking the middle, they're the only carrier still blocking middle seats so that consumers feel safer. Um, so um, I do think there's gonna be some big winners and losers um, who have invested in that consumer experience more so than just the rewards. Right, I do think that, um, again, going back to the control point, uh, pay with points gives you a little more control. I think people understand that whenever it's not pure cashback, there's, there could be a hidden advantage somewhere. You know, the provider is giving them a certain incentive or discount to use their points compared to having to get cash out of the system and then go and buy things in cash. So they're on the lookout for these opportunities and, you know, savvy enough to be able to compare what do I get with my cash versus using points directly with a with provider. And, you know, it's more options. So, and I fully agree with Simon. I think companies who are more transparent with the value of their points and how they can be converted will win. Because I think the time where people didn't understand that there were different conversion values has gone by. And people are savvy enough not to know this. Uh, so whether you do it, you pay with points, you go through cash, you go through a, a crypto, um, or you're directly redeeming, people have a calculator out, they're trying to figure out, what can I get with my 50,000 points? And once they figure that out, I think the providers will make it easier and give them more options are the ones who are going to win. Yeah, it's clear that uh, points are becoming a currency that people understand as currency rather than something that's kind of tangential or different. And, and I, I would think that anything that enables a, a consumer to use their points in a different way strengthens the value of the points, both for the issuer and for the consumer. I, I think it's, it's kind of a win for everybody. I'll just add a, a shameless self-promotion here, but we're launching our TP, relaunching our TPG app this June, which uh, will track all your loyalty points. And actually on the home screen, it's gonna give your net worth at our valuations. You can go in and revalue the points based on you know what you get value of, but we feel strongly that you know, consumers, there's so many people have points all over the place and people have a lot more in value. They just don't realize it. And the average consumer isn't going to check 24 different websites and, you know, keep their points active. So um, we believe in the end, everyone will win because when people realize there's value in these programs and, and engage, every loyalty manager knows the more people redeem, the better customer over time you're going to have. So, um, but we still think that there's a lot of friction in the marketplace and letting consumers know what they can actually do with their points. And that's in June, that's launching, Brian? Yep. Okay, cool. Make sure I get it then. Um, one of the things that hasn't taken off in the U.S. is coalition loyalty programs like the Air Miles program in Canada. Um, you know, Amex tried it with plenty and it didn't work. Uh, there have been several other efforts around there uh, in, in terms of using coalition loyalty. Uh, why haven't they happened in the U.S. and, and are they going to happen in the U.S.? And I'll just take it quickly. I mean, in I think in the US, our loyalty programs and credit cards are just so insanely valuable. Um, you know, the Chase has invested, you know, when they launched Sapphire Reserve at that 100,000 point bonus that created a frenzy and 1500 in real value from a single credit card launch. You know, and it's, I saw someone in the comments earlier was saying what's going to happen if our interchange goes, you know, lower. 
of course, you know, we don't see rewards like this around the world uh, as lucrative. Um, so I think the US consumer is savvy, they see the value, they feel great about their cards that, with all the different perks. Um, so when you come and try to bring a new entrant into a highly competitive marketplace with huge value for the consumer, you better come in swinging. And in the case of Plenty, I still didn't understand what the heck Plenty was. And uh, why, you know, I've used membership rewards for 20 years. Why the heck would I try to earn a Plenty point? But it's Amex, but Amex, you know. So, so I think, you know, in Canada and the UK where these coalition programs are stronger, it's because there's less competition in the marketplace. Um, so I think they could succeed, but you better spend on branding and education because consumers have a smorgasbord of, of options in the US, so. You know. All right. And, and I think there's more options here. Sorry, go ahead, Simon. No, no, go ahead, Nabil. Uh, I was going to say, well, the more option you have um, in paying with points or converting to cash or some common medium, then there's less incentive to do so because you can actually use your points somewhere else. Is there very difficult programs to set up because you have all the companies that have to get into agreement and create exchange values. It's even more complicated to pr explain to the consumer. So, you know, I think as Brian said it well, um, we're spoiled here and it, it was coming into a market that was already very well served and very generous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the truth of the matter is, if, if I have a chase card um, and I want to go uh, buy gas at one gas station on day one and buy gas at another gas station on day two, I can do that and still earn points. And, and I don't have to select which gas station I'm going to go to, which I think is always the gating factor on, on a coalition loyalty program. Consumers don't behave the way that coalition loyalty programs want them to. Um, you go where you're going to go and you want to spend where you want to spend. And, and that's where... To Brian's point, we're, we're amazingly spoiled in our loyalty programs. We just have really good programs, um, which is pretty cool. Um, so let's look a little bit ahead. Um, what is the one big thing that you foresee in the future of credit and debit card loyalty rewards in the next year or so? Yeah, so I'll go, I'll go first. Um, you know, the, the, the one thing for me that, that still hasn't really been solved yet as, you know, specifically in, in the travel side of things is to remove friction from the overall planning and kind of uh, research process all the way to kind of, you know, what, what happens on your day of travel and then uh, at the end of it. So uh, I definitely feel like we got to get better at uh, figuring out how to inspire people again, how to make it simpler to, uh, to collaborate, to go, go out there, whether that's with families or with friends and, um, and, and figure out this next destination that you want to scratch off. So that's, you know, number one. And then I think the most immediate trend is uh, people are not necessarily ready to go back to the big city, whether we see this in Burkina or now as well. Um, there's more of the off the beaten path. And so I think the notion of, um, you know, ecotourism perhaps or volunteerism, or maybe you actually going to go to a, you know, to a spa for a week, uh, you know, to go do some meditation and mindfulness and, and, and get out of the craziness and get off of 12 hour Zoom calls. I think we will see more and more uh, of folks who just want to experience travel, experience the world again, you know, meet up, meet up. And so um, those are some of the programs I'm personally excited about. And I think you will see that, uh, you know, uh, that probably emerge into the loyalty space. So Simon, just a question on that. Are you talking about, when you talk about planning ahead for the for travel, you're talking about kind of like a social model where a, two couples or three couples can plan together and you and bring their points into the same project or what are you thinking about? Yeah, perhaps. I mean, it, it's, it's, I mean, literally if you, if you, if you traveled, you know, you probably have 30 taps open or so to figure out like, where do you want to go and in which hotel you want to stay in, and you're going to look at TripAdvisor and you're going to look somewhere else. You're going to ask a friend and, you know, so it's, 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 it's cumbersome if you're actually, you know, going out. And so we did, we totally believe that there is value of, of a, of a travel agent, there's value of, of providing uh, ways to uh, figuring out, uh, you know, how to make this way simpler. So you don't spend three, four days on just research uh, on something that you didn't go, oh shit, I didn't see that there's a busy street next to the pool that looked very serene, right? Uh, so yeah. I think there's other ways to, to look at loyalty of providing again, uh, services and, and perhaps ways to engage with 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 customers outside of just uh, you know the point redemption process. Yeah, I'll just chime in. I mean, I think we saw recently. Uh, 
I was shocked. I think we're going to see some acquisitions and mega partnerships that will shock us. I, I was shocked when Wyndham Hotels bought the Travel and Leisure brand uh, to market their hotels in a unique, compelling way. Uh, we just saw Capital One and Hopper uh, teamed up in a really unique way. Uh, so I, I see more and more of this in executive assignments point that people like let's create synergies between different parts of the booking process. And at the points guy, we just bought Lonely Planet um, through our, our parent company and we plan some really unique, the points guy will help you use your points and travel. And then instead of us trying to compete on destination info, we're going to integrate into, okay, you're going to Ghana and here's all of our really great on the ground, you know, to plan the Ghana trip of a lifetime. And oh, by the way, United Airlines is now launching their Accra flight and you have points to go. So trying to pull together. I do think one area the credit card companies could improve on, you know, we've seen the hotel, we got to, people are stressed about travel, especially international travel. We're dealing with the health pandemic. What if I get sick? What if, you know, can I come home? Am I going to get into the U.S.? Does travel insurance cover it? In the beginning of the pandemic, it was no. Now some policies are covering certain exclusions. You know, so I do think, you know, car companies have been great about giving TSA pre-check and making, you know, the, the process of travel easier, lounge access. I think there needs to be more on, you know, book on this card and no matter what you're protected. And I do think card issuers that come out with the book, booking confidence, I think will gain big as well. Um, you know, testing, if you book your trip through Chase Ultimate Rewards, you can get testing integrated or something like that. I think people would really latch on to that because we write posts every day about the process to get back in the US and what PCR test counts, does my, even though the vaccine passport, can I actually use the CDC one? I heard I have to get the World Health one. There's so much confusion. So I think, um, you know, card card issuers and, and the and, and travel industry need to come together a little bit better to pull it all together because the rules going country to country, what test, when it needs to be done is mind boggling uh, for the average consumer. Yeah, I agree. I see, I mean, one thing that's here to stay, I think is travel. There's something beautiful in uh, your annual spending effort being rewarded at the end of the day with a beautiful renovation. And you have this little piggy bank that's accumulating for you. Um, what I think will change is that the options that you have, the partnership that, that uh, get together to give you a great experience. Um, but what I also think we'll see is a trickling down of the sophistication of reward programs to kind of more mid-sized retailers as well. I mean, you have all the big banks and, and big FIs, hotels and so on, offering very sophisticated program running promotions. We've built our, our platform, for example, to enable smaller businesses to be able to run different type of programs in parallel, to run promotions at a different time of the day or, or different week or different time of the month so that you can constantly innovate and keep your consumer acted on their toes. So I think technology is going to help commoditize a little more these more sophisticated programs. And I'd also be interested in seeing if we will see more uh, paid for benefits type program emerging. Like we've always had like the upper tier of cards, which mostly gave you business or travel benefits uh, fee be very popular, but that was usually with a more affluent population. So. What Amazon Prime has proven is people are willing to pay $19 a month or so to get some fundamental benefit of something they use a lot. You know, Lyft has a, a similar program now where if you pay, I think it's $18.99, you get 15% discount on all rights. So who else can come up with these programs where you create a recurring revenue stream from your consumer base, but you're giving them a little more benefit that's valuable for them. And, and I think we're gonna find more of those. Interesting. It's almost like a concierge service around loyalty and points and travel, uh, where where you're you're creating more value beyond the points and more value beyond just going from point A to point B. It's it's really arranging the whole thing uh, and coordinating. It's that's an interesting idea, uh, and I, I would expect to see companies doing that. Um, maybe an independent company starting that. I don't know. Um, so we have a couple minutes left before we get to Q and A. So uh, my last question is. Five years from now, what would the loyalty reward space look like in financial services? Easy question. Simon, that's you, you run a loyalty program. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and, and I predicted that non-refundable affairs would be out in a year from now, so I don't know how well I am gonna predict five years out, but um, you know, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. 
uh, you know, look, I, I think there are ways uh, to to engage, uh, you know, with customers. You just have to be at the point of of really what's what's happening. So I put my design thinking hat on again, right? You can't just be um, in a silo um, uh, developing programs and or features overall. I think you really have to then understand kind of what's happening with, you know, with consumers. Um, you know, speaking of that, so I'll I'll take you know kind of the point on the travel because that's sort of my my bread. Bread, bread and butter. Uh, I do definitely feel like that there are going to be more and more um, volunteerism, ecotourism, wellness tourism type of things. I think people are, you know, you'll see probably less city trips per se, but you see more uh, folks actually going to, you know, look at health and wellness. I think that's one of the things we, we learned through the, the COVID piece is that health is, is uh, immeasurable and also family and friends. Uh, so I think you'll see some of those uh, combined again of, of really, uh, you know, taking care of our bodies, taking care of our minds, uh, go and see friends, go and see the world. I, I feel like that's that's over the next couple of years, definitely a theme as we're coming out of this pandemic. Maybe you'll... Yeah. Well, uh, I agree with Simon. I think higher quality of life and being able to, to do that with your kids will be higher on the agenda. And look, today we live in the AI, age of AI and hyper-personalization. So I think you're going to have more sophisticated system tracking consumer behavior, trying to understand what is most valuable to them and putting the right offer in front of them at the right time, uh, which would be a way for companies to offer their rewards liability smartly and actually create something more interesting for the consumer or the consumer ends up getting more um, using lemon sense. Uh, or a, a lower conversion rate, but still feel like they're getting a lot for their money. I mean, you, you could, if you're an FI, if you're tracking your consumer spending for a year, you can track past vacation, you can even maybe go onto other website, track ranking of places they've been, see what they like, see what they tend to do, and ultimately present them with a trip to Portugal or um, a local vacation, um, a health vacation in, in a local spa, because that's what they've been talking about. And, and, and with the ability to listen on consumer actions and conversations and using AI to aggregate and, and hyper-personalize certain offers, I think we're gonna see more and more of that. I think it's gonna be a much more exciting place for everybody. Yeah, I'm, I mean, maybe just this will be as a, from the consumer lens, what I think needs to happen is the whole loyalty airlines, uh, the technology stacks they're on are, uh, don't communicate with each other you know, if you're I'm flying an American Airlines flight and checking a Hyatt hotel, I know there are companies like Jernera that are trying to connect the dots across travel. And, you know, you fly Star Alliance carriers, but sometimes you don't get your frequent flyer miles. So you have to fax in your boarding pass to the airline headquarters in another country, cross your fingers and hope that, you know, they deposit your points two months later. And, you know, let me double check. Like, there's a lot of, and even you know, at, with the TPG app, our future goal is to sh give you your, the lens of all your rewards points and then help you get there. Today, if you have Amex, Chase, uh, Capital One, uh, your Delta Miles and American, and you wanna use them to go to Croatia, where do you start? I mean, it's like, okay, let me start reading hours worth of point sky posts or threads here. and. Let me ask my friend. Oh, she, I know she's good with her Capital One points, and, but their ratios are different. And it's like high, highly complex. You know, you can go and search for paid tickets on Google Flights instantly and get a sense of the cost. But if you want to figure out the best way from New York to Paris, you got to go one by one. And the same flight can cost 10 different prices on different carriers. And so we're trying to solve for that. Um, you know, there's obviously every airline and Loyalty program wants to keep their members in there, you know, and I get that from a loyalty manager focusing on their singular program, but we're trying to solve the bigger problem. And I think in the end, when consumers actually realize how valuable these points are, people, you know, people, more people will get into loyalty, younger generations who are used to good technology. Um, so basically, I think in five years, I hope that with blockchain technology, there's much more interaction between programs, much more interchangeability between programs to satisfy you know, people's actual needs and, and personalized offers based on um, the data from different programs. So that how cool would it be if you have all your points and you come into a, a, a portal that says, okay, based on where you, you wanna go and where you've been in the past and the type of hotels you stay in, we think that this is the coolest trip. And oh, by the way, there's availability. 
So I may have never thought about going to the Azores, but you can take your family of four, you know, the airline wins because they've got availability that they're able to release to fill their seats. And so I just think that technology can help us maximize points way more than today. And, uh, and I don't believe that will be to the detriment of loyalty programs where everyone's just getting these first class redemptions. Um, so yeah, that's where I hope loyalty goes in the next five years. I think it's a, I think it's a sound path that makes a whole bunch of sense based on what you guys have said. And with that, uh, I think we have some time for some questions, Mr. Mazursky. Yeah, thank you very much, Thad. Thanks for moderating today's session. And I wanna thank our panelists, Simon, Nabil, and Brian. Um, we have a lot of questions and I'm not, I know we're not gonna get to all of them. I'm gonna start going through the ones that uh, are here, try to um, jump around a little bit. Um, one question that came up is, how will a large reduction in the business travel revenues that we are um, now seeing affect the rewards programs uh, today and going forward? Any, uh, any feel? I'll just say, I just think business travel is just going to be different. I mean, every personal trip I take now is business too. And I know so many friends who, uh, Nabil, you're in Fort Lauderdale which, right now because you can be. Um, the people, the business travel, you know, I do think, you know, the conferences will come back to a certain extent. I know at my company, we're going to be remote, but we're going to do better trips, more team building, cool, authentic trips to build the team together versus just, you know, I, I won't go back. Our, my parent company is in Charlotte and it's way too many 5 a.m. flights out of LaGuardia to go to a meeting and come back exhausted, not going to the gym, eating unhealthily. Like, so I think, you know, that blend of business and leisure, people working for weeks at a time in Puerto Rico, which so many people are doing right now. So it's kind of business in a way, even though the businesses aren't funding that. I, I do think companies will become more flexible with what they reimburse. Um, so yeah, I think business travel will just look different and I think it'll be woven into leisure travel. So I think in general, people will travel more for leisure um, and blend in their business with it. And then I think there'll be unique business events that pull people together in really meaningful ways. So spending a little bit more on a quarterly conference uh, and giving your employees a cool immersive experience at a jungle hotel with health and fitness versus just doing a ton of like boring back and forth trips for FaceTime, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Money 2020 has announced that they're gonna have a live conference this year. That'll be in October. Uh, and that's, that's gonna be kind of interesting to see what happens with that. Yeah, I mean, the, the interesting thing for me is, you know, like if you think about it, if this pandemic had, had happened 10 years ago, we could have not done these, uh, you know, great uh, video conferences, right? And being on audio for six, seven, eight hours, that would have been super exhausting. And it gave an opportunity for people to really, you know, live and work remote. So the question is really, you know, uh, are there, is the kind of this work from home something that's going to be here to stay? Are people... Uh, travel to you know different locations uh to you know just work for for a month as well so i, I just wondered right how how much are we going to get back into the uh you know business travel the way we used to and i come from the business travel side right um it's it's been always a hey i have to connect with somebody i have to see somebody we have to kind of meet and uh but the question is it's actually working uh pretty darn well uh in this remote environment by seeing by seeing folks so It'll be interesting to see how, how, well, it definitely will come back, but, you know, I wonder whether there's, a, like to Brian's point, there's going to be more of a shift of, you know, some some people say this leisure, this, you know, business and leisure travel uh, as well, whether we see more of that where you may go on a business trip, but then you, you know, tag on a vacation. So it, it's definitely, it's not going to come back in a way that we, we've, we've seen it before would be my prediction. Well, let me ask a question that I think applies to, uh, to all of you guys from your different perspectives. Um, what do you think needs to be done by the marketers of these rewards and loyalty programs to better educate and inform customers, um, to communicate with customers, to survey and understand customers, given the dramatic changes that have occurred uh, in the whole rewards and loyalty uh, environment? Any sense of what needs to be done going forward? I mean, I'm happy to talk a little bit on the technology side. Um, what what I mentioned earlier about AI and, and even think personal assistance, right? Why do you want to have somebody go through pages and pages of whether web pages or, or in paper of information to figure out how to best plan whether their trip or the use of their rewards, right? You, you could chew up a solution and put it in front of them based on past habits, what your AI engine 
in spits out and um, your understanding of customer behavior and the timing. So, uh, I mean, you could have, imagine having a personal assistant where you say, I'd like to take the trip uh, with the family and to a warm place to the beach. And then the AI goes and figures out what are, uh, what Brian was saying earlier, inexpensive places, lots of availability, airline promotions, a great redemption for your points, calculates all of that and gives you back three or four places to look at rather than you doing all the brain damage. And I think that's going to become more and more reality. Today you have AI that are hyper-personalized that handle each customer case and remember their history separately. And so you could build up that history and have the engine give you the information for that particular customer at that particular time that is different for another customer at the same time. Uh, Simon, not that I want to put you on the spot, but what the heck, why not? Um, let, let me ask you from your perspective, from Chase's perspective, is there you know, a way to, to better communicate with customers given the, the unique situations we're facing now and going forward? Is there a unique way for personalized communication maybe that hasn't been done uh, previously? Yeah, I would say, I mean, we're thinking about uh, now as people coming back and want to travel again, to Brian's earlier point, like, you know, what are the policies? How do you get in somewhere? What do I need to bring? What, is, what do I expect on the plane in the hotel? And I think it's, it's, it's perhaps just even that piece of it of what's kind of, you know, top of mind right now in terms of as I'm, uh, you know, getting back to the airport and, uh, you know, have things changed. So, so it's, it's perhaps just as simple as um, holding hands a little bit and educating people again that travel is looking different and, and, and what to expect on, on kind of the journey overall. I think where it gets interesting and, you know, I, I've been part of a, of a concept with Microsoft, gosh, this is now 15 years ago or so, where we were, ID, you know, trying to figure out ideating around just a handoff of the plane late, lands late and, you know, why does the hotel not know about that, right? And it's all booked kind of in the same, in the same record. So, uh, you know, will we see more um, kind of interchange of data that's actually happening between the different providers, uh, you know, to make that happen would certainly be something that's, uh, you know, that's of interest. Uh, or, you know, I'm landing somewhere and I have to figure out, you know, where I need to go pick up my lift right. Um, it's still sometimes complicated uh, as well. And, and technology, I think, could do way more. So I, I, I'm actually personally interested in, you know, will we see more of this, uh, you know, personalized or can we use technology in a way that that kind of links these different, different trip components much better than what we're doing now? Uh, I'm dying to ask like 10 more questions here and I think we're gonna have a chance to ask them all, but so, someone did ask, um, how are companies now dealing with uh, use periods that are expiring, um, expiration dates? So are we beginning to see um, flexibility or leniency? I know I, I got hit on one of my programs and they like took out all the points and said, whoops, you know, program's over. And then I sent them a not so nice note and the reaction was, oops, we made a mistake. Are companies now beginning to, to try to quickly say, you know, we've suspended these, these expiration dates or we've prolonged for another year or what's happening? Yeah, the, I mean, the airlines are, you know, they've, uh, Certainly in the beginning of the pandemic, when the cash crunch was real, they were being naughty, many airlines and uh, not giving refunds where refunds were due when flights were canceled and trying to give vouchers with very short lead time. So uh, some were very good. I, I mean, I'm not paid by Delta, but Delta really went above and beyond when we did a survey of people, you know, Delta was refunding tickets uh, that technically should have just gotten vouchers, but um, yeah, we're coming up on that one year mark now. And, you know, a lot of people still can't travel or aren't comfortable, you know, traveling, which we all should understand. So I do believe, you know, companies should be proactive and continuing to extend um, the, the expiration. I think in general, the airlines, especially now that uh, things are better, cash crunch, you know, most of the airlines should be or the big airlines like United and Delta will probably be cash positive in April with the way things are going. Americans now pulling all of its planes out of storage, which is kind of shocking. So, um, so yes, I, I think they're much better nowadays, but I do, it's up to the consumer to know where your vouchers are. I know, um, you know, United now features future flight credits prominently. Amex, when I log in, all my vouchers on my account are displayed prominently. So I would push every loyalty program to 
remind the consumer to get value out of it instead of trying to hope that they just can't keep track. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, early on in the pandemic, uh, you know, we we negotiated uh, really, really hard on the lodging sets. Brian brought it up, like all, all our um, lodging reservations that were done with points uh, that you canceled, we were able to refund all those points, you know, through um, we're obviously working with um, all of the um, card members and consumers that have airline reservations to, uh, you know, either extend, uh, we're working with airline partners, but, you know, we're taking a stand of, of uh, that we want to take care of, of customers um, as, as we can through it. So we're working with airline partners to either extend, you know, them out. So most airlines have now extended them out to the end of the year. My advice would be if you have uh, any kind of uh, uh, travel, future travel credit or travel voucher, uh, book something, uh, even if you're not sure that, that you're going to travel now to at least, you know, preserve the value of it. Um, and, uh, you know, if there are any kind of expired situations, I mean, we're looking at it case by cases, but our mantra is to take care of the customer. So um, we, we will do the right thing. You know, we, we are getting more questions in now than before. I'm having a hard time, like, staying ahead of this. I'm going to ask one last question, and then I think we're going to have to end it for today. But... Um, a question came up about sustainability and are uh, organizations now thinking about sustainability in the context of how you can redeem rewards, for example, buy carbon credits. Is that becoming a thing now or, you know, not so much? It, I mean, I'll just chime in. I don't think there's a lot of great redemptions. Um, and to be fair, uh, from the consumer angle, you know, we write about carbon emissions and credits at the point sky and it's like that content lands with a dud, you know, I think a lot of people still have their head in the sand with it. I do think there are certain companies like United has come out and said, you know, they hope to re reduce their carbon footprint by 100% or, you know, by in the next 20 years and airlines are, you know, Virgin is doing biofuels and the industry knows that it needs it can't just come back to where it was it wasn't sustainable before over tourism um, but in terms of loyalty sustainability and loyalty i have to say it's not um i don't think it's something consumers have really pushed for um and right now i don't yeah i think there should be but uh i haven't seen too much in the loyalty and point space around that yeah, and we were, we were thinking about it as as well. I mean, you know, the, the the notion of kind of carbon offsetting is not new. I mean, this is you know stuff that also happened in, even in the in the '90s with business travel of your programs where you could either you know buy buy or sell carbon. Um, you know, so I'm not sure what's going to be the right answer. What we try to 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 do is kind of in the here and now of of uh, allowing for you know kind of pay yourself back in in donating points to charity. So. Um, that was one thing where we felt, you know what, there is in the, in the here and now something that we can do. It doesn't necessarily answer the question on sustainability, but in terms of just, you know, good stewards and why are we doing this in the, in the first place? Um, but it's, it's, an, it's one that, you know, we're watching carefully to kind of see is there a, a re, the trend re-emerging again? It was kind of slumbering for 10 years. Nobody really, uh, you know, took it seriously. But uh, I think there is, there is definitely something to be said about, you know, what, what do we need to do? But, you know. We, we will see what, what that is at the end of the day. You know, there's a reason why they're called rewards programs. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's rewarding behavior and, and rewards are supposed to make you happy and make you feel good and give you something that you otherwise wouldn't have had. And, and as altruistic as, as it should be for sustainability and for charitable giving as well, um, you know, the, I think the first instinct with a rewards program is to get a reward. Um, and that's kind of the way the entire infrastructure is designed. Um, Thad, uh, thank you. Kind of on that note, um, unfortunately, there's probably another 10 or 12 questions that didn't get to be asked today. I'm going to ask everybody, uh, if you want to, you can save uh, the chat on the bottom of the chat's screen on the right side. There are three dots. Click on that and allows you to save the chat. Number two, if anybody wants to put their contact information uh, in the chat area, um, others on this, uh, this call could uh, connect with you and vice versa. Um, we're finding that uh, that, that networking aspect uh, has been um, very helpful to many people. Um, again, I want to thank uh, you, Thad. Thanks, Simon, Brian, and Nabil for your contributions today and your, your opinions. It's been fantastic. Um, uh, what we're going to try to do now is 
have a, a, a short breakout session of 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, I'm gonna ask Nikki to uh, help uh, explain what we need to do to get into the chat sessions. And what we're gonna do there is basically introduce ourselves to each other, get to know each other a little bit, and then ask any questions. If there are questions we wanna to direct to, towards anybody, could be the panelists, it could be anybody. Nikki, 